This is Duke University. Welcome to the 10th annual Duke Startup Challenge Elevator Pitch Competition. My name is Sanjay Krishnamurti, I'm your MC for the evening. And a couple of things about, about the event and about why I'm here today. Uh, one, I love technology, so it just blends in with what I want to do and where I want to be. I'm also part of the, the Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Club at Duke. And I'm also on the cabinet for the high tech, uh, high tech club, so all this kind of comes together. And I guess the more important reason is I'm part of a team that's pitching for an idea tomorrow. So it, I can feel the excitement that you guys are probably going through right now. And I guess the last event, last reason for me to be here, you don't have to dress up for this, right? Entrepreneurship, that's what you love about entrepreneurship. Um, so anyways, your name could be here. And the grand finale is, is in April. And I'll, I'll walk you through how you can get to the $25,000 and have your name in that, in that spot over there. Um, but let me introduce the Duke Star Challenge to you guys. It is not a day event. You guys are here today, but it's, it's part of a longer event that's through the course of the year. It starts off with the elevator, elevator pitch competition. It's a week-long event. Follow, we follow through with the executive summary competition that happens in January, and then eventually people who have made it through that round make it to the finals in, in April. The key thing to note here is if you have, if there are people in the audience today that have not signed up and are just here to, to see how the event runs, you can still sign up for the next Sunday competition in January and still try and get a shot at making the $25,000 in April. Uh, we have a bunch of tracks that are participating. Um, I'll, I'll walk you guys through it, but there are, out of all the tracks that are happening this week, has, has seen uh, the tracks. Uh, Single the undergrad track happening on Monday, and then the healthcare and energy track uh, pitching ideas yesterday. Today we're doing the women in IT and media, and then there's a, a couple of tracks on Thursday, and then the grand finale on Friday at Janine at 5:30. Whether or not you guys make it through this round, I highly encourage all of you guys to show up in Janine on Friday. It's going to be the best of all tracks showing up for the grand finale. Today, we're going to have two teams from each track. So in this case, from the IT and media track, we're going to have two teams advance into the next round. One of them is going to be the judge's choice. The other one's going to be an audience choice, and that's you guys uh, voting on which team or which idea you, you like the most. And we have about 19 teams registered for this evening. Uh, we, we're not quite sure how many are going to show up. If more show up, we'll have more pitches. If less, it's the, the number is going to be lower. And if the two winning teams are going to walk away with cash prize of approximately two fifty dollars and two copies of Intuit, or one each, uh, which is valued at about four hundred dollars. So, fun evening. Um, the final event is going to be uh, judged by by um, Bill Maris, who's part is. On the Google Ventures team is one of the co-founders of Google Ventures, and he's going to be here on Friday at Janine. So make sure you guys are there. Let me now introduce the judges. Um, we have an eminent panel of judges for this evening. Sue couldn't be here for family reasons, but I'll let the other judges introduce themselves. Um, I'm Joe Velk. Uh, I graduated from Fuqua in '85, and uh, when I uh, got out of Fuqua, Intersoft Partners was just getting started, and I spent five years there. And then I spent 10 years at another fund in Raleigh called the North Carolina Enterprise Fund. And um, I've been just doing deals on my own now, uh, primarily doing early stage uh, information technology companies, software and uh, software, or software and semiconductors. Jesse Lipson, I was an uh, undergrad at Duke, graduated in 2000 with a degree in philosophy and somehow found my way into internet startups. and. Uh, Currently working on my third startup called ShareFile. It's basically a web-based service. It's a password-protected area for your clients to log in and exchange business files securely. We're based in Raleigh. We have about our 25 employees and uh, about 8,200 corporate customers and users. My name is David Samuel. 
I applied to both Duke and MIT in 1990. Duke didn't let me in. I went to MIT. <laughs> and uh, I uh, became an internet entrepreneur. Um, had a Web 1.0 company called Spinner, which is internet radio, and a Web 2.0 company in the internet video space um, in the mid 2000s. Today I'm doing um, internet uh, angel investing under the name Freestyle Capital. Thank you, judges. Before we move on, I wanted to take a moment to, to thank our sponsors. It's thanks to these guys that we have not just the, the competition today, but the, the Duke Startup Challenge in general, and also the Entrepreneurship Week at Duke. So we have the Hutchinson Law Group, the Intercept Partners, we've Intuit, HPG, uh, Square One Bank, Business Pro, and uh, Wedek Robbins for sponsoring this event and, and basically the Entrepreneurship Spirit <coughs> at, at Duke. So. Um, I know we're all ready to go. You guys are probably waiting for me to walk away from here so you can start pitching. But I'm going to ask Dave here to uh, speak to us about the event, about anything that's on his mind, basically, uh, before we get started. Great, thank you. So I uh, pulled together this pitch uh, right before this um, competition. And basically, it's called Pitch to Prototype. Can I see it up here? Or do I, I guess it doesn't matter. So um, I'm just going to give you three snapshots, at least with the experience for me, and then try to sum it up with just an overall theme, which is uh, the Pitch to Prototype. So uh, as I mentioned, I started an internet company in January of 96. And I was a year and a half uh, out of college with $15,000 worth of seed capital. Um, I didn't really have any entrepreneurial experience, at least the training that you guys have here. Like these, there was there was a business plan competition at MIT, but it was not nearly as uh, as um, intense as what you guys were able to to learn uh, from an entrepreneurial perspective. And basically, um, I had a screenshot of this of this internet radio um, company that I wanted to start, and I walked into a law firm. Gunnarsson Detmer Stowe, which actually was, they were starting their law firm also, and Bob Gunnarsson said, you know, he would, he would uh, incorporate the DJ um, back in the day, and we, would, we didn't have to pay him back until we raised our Series, series A um, worth of financing. So, uh, really, we had the idea kind of in January. On an April 1st, we launched with six channels of commercial free music, and so it was really 90 days from the idea to when we launched. And then we had um, kind of, we were picked up as Cool Sight of the Day. This is real old school. I don't know if anybody, does anybody remember Cool Sight of the Day? We have one, one person in the back who remembers it. So basically, I mean, back when, this was when Yahoo still wasn't even um, the main place to go. There, there wasn't necessarily, it was all kind of wild, wild west. So anyway, people would go to Cool Sight of the Day where a blogger, I guess you could say, would choose one site that he thought was good. So that was, that was way back in the day. Um, so my Web2.0 company, Grouper, this is a screenshot of the prototype. Basically, we had the idea we wanted to share files privately. Um, I have an, kind of an entrepreneurial and engineering background, though I'm really not. I've kind of lost the ability to code. So we posted um, on Craigslist saying, you know, can I find a CTO to, who can build this um, prototype relatively quickly? Met, uh, met our CTO quickly via Craigslist, and, and really within 90 days, we had a prototype. And then with that prototype, we were able to go um, close a round of financing that had a you know, nice, healthy Series A free money valuation. And um, it allowed, allowed us to, to continue to move the company forward. This is just a, a story of a company that I've recently invested in. Um, they kind of had the idea. 90 days later, they had a prototype put together. And then we, we did a debt round. And two weeks ago, um, we had uh, some uh, traditional VCs come in with a, a 750K Series A. Um, so kind of the, the overall theme, this was a quote that Seth had put on um, TechCrunch, which uh, I th really think sums up 
at least what happens within the internet space, the wonderful thing about the internet space is there's no barriers to entry, and uh, that's why I love this quote. At the exact moment you had your idea, 10 other people had the exact same idea. <laughs> there was just something in the environment that made it the right time for folks to think that one up. The race has already begun. In six months, you're gonna cry when you see someone else put out the same product that you're pitching me right now. So the kind of the, the overall pitch here, the overall kind of theme with this is you do want to obviously come think about the idea and, and, and pitch it, but you don't want to spend six months to twelve months like analyzing and doing focus groups and and um, continuing to second guess whether it's a good idea or not. The wonderful thing about software and the internet today is with the tool sets, cloud computing, you know, the smarter en software engineers that exist today, you can build a prototype within 90 days for not a lot of money, and you can really um, then take that particular product and show it to investors, you can show it to customers, you can show it to your friends, and instead of just talking about it, you're able to actually have something tangible. So that's the wonderful thing about the internet space where you can build things relatively quickly. Uh, so the overall theme is 90 days from idea to prototype puts your startup on the winning path. So we'll see if any of these pitches I see this evening, if we're going to see you know, a prototype within 90 days. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so the final is in April. That gives us more than 90 days. So you guys have time. But make sure you kind of take this to heart and, and work through this. Now to kind of kick things off for the evening, I'm going to introduce Josh, who's going to be the flow manager and the official person who's going to run this event to the clock and make sure everybody is able to deliver a pitch. Uh, get, get Thanks, Sanjay. Thank uh, my name is Josh Moore. I'm a first year student at Fuqua. And this event's really important to me for two reasons. One, I'm on the EVCC cabinet. <clears throat> and also, uh, like Sanjay, I'm on a team that's uh, competing this week as well. So uh, it's, we're having a lot of fun so far. Is there anyone that was here at one of the other tracks earlier in the week? A couple people. All right, good. So you guys can help me through this. Uh, the logistics. For those of you that weren't, uh, each competitor is going to have two minutes to pitch their idea. The judges will then have three minutes of Q&A with the, uh, the person, and they'll stay right up here. Uh, audience won't be able to do any Q&A, but you will be able to help us out by filling out the forms that are in front of you, the feedback forms. And uh, those are really beneficial for the people that are going to be competing on Friday that win this competition, and, and all the other pitchers as well. Just give them feedback on their idea and help them uh, improve their start. Two teams from this track will make it to the finals on Friday. Uh, there will be a judge's choice, which will be based on a, you know, the tradition and the, the, the idea behind an elevator pitch, which is to get a second meeting. So the judges will be evaluating, you know, if they were in town and had 60 more minutes to allocate across three teams, would they give you one of those slots? Um, and then the other winner is going to be the audience choice. You guys get the text to vote uh, for the group that you think did the best. And uh, we'll explain the details of that later on. The judge's winner is going to get $150 in cash tonight and also a copy of uh, QuickBooks Pro. As well as the audience winner will get $100 in cash and a copy of QuickBooks Pro. So that's, uh, that's about what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to need your help, audience, on one more thing. When uh, I put up this sign, I'm going to need you to yell stop. That will indicate to our pitcher that, that they've uh, ran out of time. So if we can uh, get a little practice. You know, I'm up here pitching my great idea to the judges and telling them great how great it's going to be. Uh, oh, you guys got it better than that. Come on, let's try it again. So I'm up here and, and I'm asking for fifty thousand dollars right now. Stop. Stop. All right. Thanks. Okay. Without further ado, we are uh, we're going to get started. Uh, just a little thing: when you're up here, pitchers, try to stay uh, somewhere near the microphone so we can catch you on on, uh, on the video. And also, if you just kind of give Sanjay a nod and you're ready to go, and he'll start the timer. Let's hear some pitches. First up. Quiet nest. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Hello, my name is Eddie Oistacher, and I'm first year MBA student at Fuqua. Imagine it's a beautiful day. You open the window to enjoy the sun and the breeze, and this is what you hear. This annoying noise can really ruin your day. Let me try to fix it. Is it better? A little bit. 
What you have just witnessed is called active noise cancellation, and our product is based on, on this technology. What actually happened is one of the speakers generated an opposite noise wave, which canceled out the noise which came from the second, second speaker. For home usage, for example, we'll install a sensor on the speaker on a window pane to cancel the, com the coming uh, noise from outside. Unlike traditional, uh, the, unlike traditional noise control techniques, such as double pane window, our product will allow free air movement and natural light come in. According to the American Housing Survey, more than 100 million Americans are exposed every day to noise levels which excess of 55 decibels, which is detrimental to their healthcare. Active noise cancellation is used widely in closed air environments, such as office air ducts and headphones. While these applications are new and innovative, they are, they are reduced, <coughs> they are while these applications are new and innovative, they are limited to reduce noise in, in, in closed air environments. Our products will take this emerging technology to the next step and, and bring it to open air, open air environments. Uh, our team includes FICO MBA students. We are currently working with some with several physics PhDs. And on our product, and today we're looking for two things. First, we are looking for engineers, some students, physics, and. Uh, thank you. <laughs> now we have three minutes of QA with the judges. Yes. Is there anything that's proprietary? No, this is actually a technology is well known. But it's used in, uh, today in closed air environments, as I explained, office air ducts. There is no proprietor, but I think this technology to take it to open air environments will require some development and probably proprietor. So just to clarify, it sounds like the unique selling proposition is, I mean, in my office, we have no noise canceling um, system in, in our office. And it seems like the differentiator is being able to take that to open air environments. Do you have the technology problem solved already for that, or you're currently still trying to solve it? We probably would have to still find solve it. That's why we will use the base techniques of five active noise technology and just continue developing to the developing response. I'm looking to me for a question. I don't know <laughs> if I have one. Um, it, it, it gets more complicated as you have like a uh, when you just have one sound to cancel out, that seems easy. But if you have a lawnmower and a car honking and kids yelling in the background, that sounds like a lot of things to be able to, to yeah, cancel out all at once. But it, it, can, it can handle multiple frequencies at once. Yeah, this, uh, this is just what this, um, simple, simple just to introduce the idea. Of course, these sensors have to be more smart and to analyze and uh, separate it on different frequencies. We are not uh, trying to say, to say that we will cancel all the noise. We will definitely reduce this more than 50%, which will already make it. I guess just so I understand the, the specifics, you're suggesting that the windows are open. Yes. And, and then you're, you're still able to use your technology and it'll lower the, this, the noise of the siren going by. Right. The window open. Right. This okay. is the advantage. What do you see as the market for the open air environments? What type of customer would buy, would be interested in buying noise cancellation in an open air environment? We see currently two types of, of customers. First one is uh, owners, uh, regular people which, who live near maybe highways, or also it can be different hotels which are located near highways or some loud environment. And the second is going to be offices. Which will which will need this in which will need these techniques to reduce sound inside the working environment. Don't have to be office. I mean, can be also factories. Uh, any feel for how big the market is? Yes. Have you done any studies about market Yeah, we started about uh, we did uh, <coughs> quite a bit. Uh, Quite a large study about the market that we didn't find any technology which is mature today. Um, but we also found a lot of demand for this. Thank you.
the power to go. Yeah. Free power anyway. <laughs> All right. Just want to remind the audience members real quick, make sure you fill out those forms and uh, give these guys feedback. I'm Andrew first. Um, I'd like to start off by getting a little audience participation. So I'm going to do five push-ups, and I'd like everyone to count off. One, One two, 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 three, four, five. Wow, I just used 1,500 joules of energy, all wasted. It could have been used to power an iPhone for almost an hour of talk time. So I'm with a startup called power to go and our goal is to harvest energy that would otherwise be wasted and to also be the source for mobile power. And we're using a technology called artificial muscles, which is a new type of material that can uh, basically flex when a power source is applied to it and can also generate power uh, when it's bent. And our first application is going to be an iPhone charger like you see on the screen. Um, to be simple, you can bend it and it can charge the iPhone as fast as if you were to plug it into the wall. And we can also display power displayed or power generated over time and you can compare it to other people around the internet. And um, <clears throat> eventually expand into the wider smart home, smartphone market, uh, which is expected to grow to 250 million units in 2012 and then also into other markets uh, such as exercise equipment or small businesses who, for example, when people open the door in the business, it can generate power. And then the key here is that we have an exclusive license with Stanford Research Institute, which developed the artificial muscle technology. Thank you. Great. So, it, so the artificial muscle technology is productized elsewhere, not power to go. Is it is it in market someplace else? Currently, it's been licensed to one other company, but it's for um, like large industrial use, and we're targeting more of the consumer market or small businesses. <coughs> and so you think like your prototype here? You think it could be that small? Like it's a little. It's a, basically a tennis ball? Is that the size that you think will work to power an iPhone? So the material can be uh, basically cut into any size. This is a dump, I mean, an example, mm -hmm. and it could possibly be larger, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going for something that is very portable, that you can just carry around with you. So if your iPhone ever runs low on battery, which happens all the time, you can just kind of pump it up and, and charge it. So I've seen two other plays within this place, within this space. One is um, Solio, which is, are you familiar with Solio? It's, 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 um, how, it's power from the sun, and then there's the crank notion. So what are your thoughts about artificial muscle versus um, solar power or maybe using a crank? Uh, solar power is not as feasible because you need a large solar panel and then you're kind of limited in where you can use it. So it has to be used outside during the daytime. Sorry. So if you're in your car or you're inside, you can't use it. And then the hand crank is, is kind of awkward. It's kind of hard to turn for a while, and it's also much less efficient than this technology. Okay. So it, it's, a, it's a type of metal, and I'm trying to understand how it works. It's, it's basically a flexible material. The technical name for it is a um, dielectric last polymer. Okay. And so basically, it's like sort of like a large capacitor that can bend uh, when current is applied, but can also work the other way, where if it's bent, it'll generate a current. So you're charging and discharging, and that's how you're, how you're doing the. Uh... So it's basically capturing the mechanical motion and converting it into power. Huh. And is it patented? Uh, yeah, I, I believe SRI holds the patent for this. And you guys have an exclusive for the consumer? Exclusive license to a patent for the consumer yeah. area? We're, we're in talks with them. Okay. To have that. And we have uh, one of the people on our team is actually a consultant for SRI um, who's been hired um, 
for the purpose of taking this technology and commercializing it. Um, what stage are you in in terms of creating a prototype that would actually work to power an iPhone? And also, what, what does that material feel like when you squeeze it? Is it something that is kind of like one of those stress balls where it's... Yeah. So currently, um, we are... Sorry, out of time. We're prototyping it currently for a class. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, iCampus? Is iCampus here? Here. Here. All right. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Ricardo Reati. I'm a first year student here at the Fugo MBA, and I'm going to present you iCampus iCampus is an online platform and network that will allow small organizations, such as small businesses, small nonprofits, or small private education institutions, to use more effectively, to be able to access to e-learning as a system of doing training. Uh, you might think of it as a metaphor, as a sort of eBay of e-learning, where like, you have some sellers and buyers, and these organizations buy and sell content, plus a platform component. Let's make a step back. What is the main problem and which are the main needs that this solution is going to address? As big organizations such as college, uh, uh, corporates, uh, public institutions are having their own e-learning platform and using it for cutting costs over classroom training, improving the learning experience of their employees or students, small organizations have two problems. They do not use e-learning while they could use e-learning because of two reasons. Cost it's too expensive, the upfront costs are too high, and second is technical capacity. They do not have an IT department to deal with it. iCampus is an online service, a software as a service, that allows to you, as a small organization, to come and open up your e-learning environment, opening up profile for your employees, and you can create content yourself and deliver them to your employees, or, since this is not just a platform, it's also a network, you can buy content in the network for, for, for content providers, organizations who have knowledge, or if you are a content provider, you can sell content. So these are the different services. I'm working on this project with three MBA, first years MBA students. Some of them have already had entrepreneurial experiences. And uh, we also have an international team. We are addressing the needs in the US market, but also the need in the, we're starting to explore the needs in South America as an emerging uh, economies. Um, I don't have specific requirements to the venture capitalists tonight because we're still at the marketing opportunity, but addressing the audience, we will be looking for uh, more technical expertise. So if you're interested, uh, come talk to us. Yeah. Is it the revenue model for iCampus who pays you? Just want to make sure I understand that. Uh, mm, the basic revenue model is a premium. So if you're a small organization, you come to iCampus, you want like, uh, you have 100 employees, you want 100 profiles, you buy 100 profiles for your employees for one year or like for two years, and you pay this service. Plus, there are a lot of additional features depending if you want feedback forums, depending on the kind of e-learning platform that you want to have, you can pay premiums. On the other side, not at the very beginning, but at a certain point, even content provider may pay us to have access to the platform because they will be selling content. So we allow content provider to create and deliver contents to their clients throughout our platform, and they can pay it for us. There are very different business models of learning, but business solutions. Okay. The thing I wonder about um, is with an eBay type business model, whether you have a chicken and egg type situation where the content providers don't want to go on the network because there's not enough people, and the people don't want to go on the network because there's not enough content. What are your plans uh, with that? Great question. Uh, at the very beginning, we need content providers. We need, we need to, what we're doing now, we're trying to understand which, here, which are the niche of clients that might be using. Given those niches, the market opportunities is there, we need content providers that will be providing content for free. So we're saying just, you have come on our platform and you can reach out to these clients and sell your content for free. Once we build up a bulk of content and we build up a, 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 a bulk of clients, we might think of, having a business model also in the content providers. But at the very beginning, that, was, that would be, of course, for free. So you're basically competing with any other e-learning um, uh, services that are out there right now? Yeah. Yeah, but it, and, and so the pitch is it's, you get it for a lower price? 
Yeah, the idea is that you the trade-off is between personalization and price. So this is going to be a kind of standard service, uh, <coughs> very low cost. And we are going to kind of enlarge the pie of organization that will be using e-learning. So we are targeting of company that cannot afford e-learning, but if there will be a, a, like a standard service, a lower cost, very easy to, to use, they would be venturing into learning, cutting on training costs, or improving their training skills. Um, that's, that's, that's our market in this way. Okay. We, found, we found a research of the European uh, Commission that like, stated explicitly that upfront costs for small organizations are still perceived to be too high. So, and also we started, we are made telephone calls, and some of people that we interviewed is like, you're learning? No, come on, it's too expensive. I don't even think about it. And they don't think about it because it's too complex and expensive in their mind. And it is. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We bring up nationalfield.org. What? I can't So as you can see, I ran here. Uh, uh, all right. my, my name is Brendan Farmer, and I'm one of the founders of National Field. National Field was created during the Obama campaign. It was a tool that was used to manage field staff across the country. Uh, since the campaign, we formed as a company. We brought in new developers. We built National Field into what it is today. It's, a, it's the world's first hierarchical social network, which means that your, your organization on National Field will have the same structure as it does in real life. Uh, so data and communication flow up and down the chain of command, and the best ideas flow to the top. On National Field, we track qu quantitative metrics, which give organizations a snapshot of how they have been doing, how they are doing, and how they will be doing. We also give managers the ability to track qualitative metrics, which allow them to identify potential problems and predict performance in the near term. Uh, we visualize data in ways that tell a story with live charts, live maps, and live leaderboards. It's very difficult for some people to look at a spreadsheet and draw a meaningful conclusion. But with National Field, we make it easy for people to identify best practices based on prior performance. We also have a, a robust communications platform with messaging, live feeds, and uh, live uh, <coughs> flash sharing. So. Um, so our team is myself and three other o Obama organizers in their mid-20s, as well as some developers. Our clients include Organizing for America, which is leading the healthcare push, uh, the British Conservative Party, the Democratic National Committee, um, a PR firm, some, a chain of Midwestern banks, 53.com, um, some nonprofits, uh, political campaigns at all levels of government. And our goal is to become the central hub for political campaigns as well as an essential tool for business. Thank you. So this is kind of like an open source? Um... Uh, no, it's software as a service. Okay, but is it in the public domain or? or uh... Um, no, we sell it to our clients. Like we, we developed it, now we sell it to our clients. Okay, okay. And how do you price it? Um, I mean, it, it would depend on the organization. It's definitely not $30 a month. Uh, for like Organizing for America is around $10,000 a month for that single contract. I, I'm sorry, just, so just a little bit, it's obviously different than the other people have pitched. So you guys have been in market for, I guess, how long have you been uh, in market? Like six months. Okay, so, it was, it, so the, the Obama piece, so national field was not used during the Obama No, it, I, I'm so sorry, I was, we, we, we've been existing, in existence as a company for about six months. It was used in all the battleground states. Um, Louisiana, it was used during the largest, voter, the largest statewide voter registration in Georgia. So it was just kind of incorporated within the last six months. Is that yes, what that's true. Okay, great. Um, I have a question about kind of, it seems like it was started with political kind of nonprofit grassroots yeah, kind true. of starts, and then you're also talking about business. Yeah. Do you imagine that being the same product to be able to span no. both of those? No, I, I mean, that, that's actually the conflict that we're running into now, is it's a pretty big jump from nonprofits to businesses. Um, I mean, obviously our core will be politics for the near future, mm -hmm. but business is definitely something that we Mm -hmm. And uh, 
why uh, are, are there other beyond politics? Are there other nonprofit areas that where you think it fits in really neatly? Uh, I mean, like we're we're working with labor unions. Um, there's a one of our uh, favorite clients is this organization that works to stop genocide, GINA. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, they're they're just a lot of uh, pretty much any large organization can find value. When you're pitching it, um, what do they compare to? Uh, what they're doing right now, or are there other products out there that are coming? I mean, the, the the thing is, big corporations design the solution for themselves. They have intranets, like IBM has something that's somewhat similar. Um, there there aren't as much like there there are social networks that are marketed towards businesses, but they're flat. They lack a lot of our a lot of our functionality, and so I guess those would be our main competitors for business for politics. Um, there's the Voter Activation Network and Blue State Digital. The van, as it's called, handles the back end of the campaign. Blue State Digital ha handles the forward-facing part. And we kind of found a niche for staff management, which nothing is done. And just briefly, so the team is you and then there's three other folks? Uh, yeah, as well as our developers. Okay. And you're Duke or Fuqua? Or? Duke. Okay. Freshman. Freshman, very well spoken for a freshman. Um, okay, we're uh, we're gonna get started again. Just uh, once again, remind you guys, uh, well, these feedback forms are really helpful. I'm, uh, as I mentioned, on on a team pitch a couple nights ago, and uh, it really helps to develop your idea. Uh, so. Fill those out after each uh, person goes, and uh, we'll pass them at the end of the night. Up next is Yosho. Good evening. My name is Tony Sparks, and I'm the CEO of Yosho. My company slogan is that Yosho is your show for show. Yosho is a company company that benefits a uh, common person and advertises everywhere. Uh, Yo, the inspiration for Yosho comes from a South Park episode in which uh, YouTube stars were seeking money for the uh, fame they have accumulated on the internet. To their dismay, they receive no money because there's no direct way to uh, accumulate wealth from the fame you get on the internet until now. Yosho is a website that is similar to uh, Yosh, YouTube and Hulu. It is similar to YouTube in that the common person can post a video on Yosho. It is similar to Hulu in that every video will have a commercial. Um, but Yosho is different in that uh, Yosho users will be able to make money from the videos they post on Yosho. Uh, this is possible because Yosho advertisers will pay Yosho users every time um, a user's video causes an ad to be seen. For example, uh, let's say that I uh, have a video on Yosho, and um, every time my, ad, my, my video plays an ad uh, from Coca-Cola is played. Um, every time uh, Coca-Cola gets their ad played, um, they pay me a penny. Um, let's say I get a million views, then I have a million pennies. If I have a million pennies, I have $10,000. Yosho is a great idea for two reasons. It is extremely lucrative, and every, it's a, everybody wins with Yosho. It's lucrative. Imagine if Yosho collected $1,000 from one successful Yosho uh, user. Um, like Now imagine what happened if Yosho collected $1,000 from a million Yosho users. Um, Yo, everybody wins, wins with Yosho because advertisers are sure that their videos are watched, um, and uh, Yosho users win because uh, they... They uh, get money or maybe even fame from the videos they post. Um, in order to get uh, Yosho off the ground, we need $20,000 to play uh, advertisers and uh, web designers. Um, Yosho, also need uh, to uh, make Yosho better, is uh, I need advertisers with commercials, so I'm quite sure Google will help me with that. Um, remember, at Yosho, it's your show for show. <laughs> <laughs> Neat idea. Um, what's to stop YouTube from doing something similar? Well, like nothing. Honestly, I have, I have to like uh, hurry up to get this developed. I'm really like trying to get this developed. I've seen like many people today just trying to get advertisers. I've uh, posted up flyers around campus look for uh, web designers and pro uh, programmers. So I'm really hustling to get this. So the team is currently you because you're trying to recruit other folks. More or less. I mean, I've I've already uh, like the flyers I put up. I already have like a, a web designer who has like um a team of uh like programmers uh, and copywriters. So like all of me is like twenty thousand dollars. Like I was talking to him through email. I need twenty thousand dollars to pay him to get this going. But uh, right now what I'm trying to do is get like help from students. Uh, 
uh, like seniors. I'm like, talking to like professors in like, computer science classes, trying to get um, programmers that like trying to get people aware about this so I can have some people on this team with me. All right, now, I'm just. What kind of content do you think will be on your show? The same type of content that's on YouTube, basically. Like, just average amateur video makers. Like, somebody getting punched in the face, or somebody tripping, somebody, like, like just, just random things that are on uh, YouTube would be the same thing on uh, your show. The only thing is that people get money for the videos that they post. I know with YouTube, now that it's gotten larger, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of legal issues they need to deal with in terms of copyright protection and, and so forth. And um, with twenty thousand dollars, how would you manage that that issue now that the publishers are very sensitive? What would stop somebody from taking a successful video from your show and putting it up themselves as a user? You know, the same video so well, they get paid too. Well, like the people I work with, my programmers, like people are on my staff, would be people that prevent that from happening. So. Do you have any um, research on the advertising rates that um, you can realistically? Well, I know that, like, honestly, um, it doesn't matter because, um, like, a, a local business owner with a thousand dollars advertised can uh, advertise on your show because they're not paying at the beginning; they're paying at the end after people watch their videos. You can pay as you go. Like, I can make it so that, like, someone says I have thousand dollars. Okay, so I say, um, well, I can only play your video how many times? Like a thousand dollars, like a penny per hit. We'll, we'll, we'll pay for it. So actually, like advertisers on any scale, they advertise on each other. Doesn't matter. And the, and the ads at the end is it just like the ads are in the beginning? Okay. Is it and so is it just like flashing up a Coca Cola logo? Give or? or take, like it, it, it could be like a fifteen second advertisement. It could be a ten second advertisement. Just an advertisement. That somebody will pay to show okay. somebody. Okay. This is essentially how TV works. Do you guys like the best? Great. Thanks, Hey, next up, there's food for you. Hi, I'm Kelly Waldman, co-founder of Food for You. I'm sure everyone in here has called a restaurant to place a takeout order and have had something go wrong at least one time. Well, Food for You is a solution for this. Food for You is an online interactive website that will feature all of Duke's Merchants for Point Spenders menu. Where you can go online, select what you want, how you want it, and list if you have any food allergies. What makes us different from our competitors is that Duke students will have the option of paying with their Duke card. And we will have a favorites button where you can order your favorite meal from your favorite restaurant in just one click. Additionally, we will have a search feature that will allow you to search for a specific type of meal and receive a list of restaurants currently serving that meal. Food for You will make its profits by charging the restaurants a monthly subscription fee as well as um, having ads on the website. Our team currently consists of myself and my co-founder, Aaron Patel. We are currently undergraduates in the Pratt School. Our team also has a third member who is a programmer to help us get the website up and running. Um, we are currently looking to have a working prototype in the next two months. Um, sorry. Um, so, sorry. Um, sorry, okay. Um, so use Food for You and make it your online ordering solution. Thanks. Thank you. Restaurants currently, at least for Duke, <coughs> accept food, food and flex points. Like how, how many um, restaurants are there, roughly? I think there's around like 20. Okay. And then, um, is there competition that exists? Uh, it, so there's not competition that exists today for this idea, at least on this campus, but are there other campuses that have this online solution that you're aware of? There are other campuses that have like the online where you can find the restaurants and their menus and um, to be able to order it, but I don't know of any right now that have the actual like however their university uses food points or flex on there. Okay. 
What kind of uh, integration issues would be involved with you accepting the flex? Are you just providing the menus and then sending the order, or are you also providing the information for them to charge the due card as well? And, and what kind of integration issues would be necessary with the um, delivery providers? It's basically like an online version of just calling in your order, except you'll be able to just put in your due card number so the restaurants will get it in an email or a fax. So they'll have all the information. It'll just basically be how you order over a phone, except online so we wouldn't have to do any of the actual like processing <clears throat> of the due card because then that would be kind of just like a credit card verification but the restaurants already have this set up since they're on the program so it's just a means of us getting the information to them currently when you call in an order and pay with your due card do you like read them your number or how do you yeah you just call in and you read them the number okay roughly how much do you expect you'll be able to charge each restaurant you said there are about 20 restaurants to service the campus per month um, well, we're still currently working that out. We're still talking to the restaurants and talking to Duke. But right now what we plan to do is give them like a month free trial so they'll be able to see how it affects their business because we're anticipating that they'll get a lot more orders. So at the end of that month trial, they can decide whether they like it or not. And then if they do, then we'll charge them probably like a small fee. We're just not quite sure yet. And uh, how... Um how big of a development effort is it? I mean, two months is a short period of time, and how many people does it take? Well, we have um, a working prototype right now. We do? Yeah, we're working on getting, um, well, we have our current programmer, and we're working on another one just to get the whole, like, the fax or email part of it set up, but we do have pretty much the, the website built. So is it just some of these integration issues that Jesse brought up that have to be taken care of? Would, so 20, 20 restaurants that doesn't seem like a lot so would you do you think you would have the ability to have more restaurants I guess once you have this system in place do you think working with Duke you could recruit more restaurants that would take this flex point oh. all right thanks a lot Kelly <laughs> be sure to give Kelly some feedback and uh, <coughs> next up we have 21 watts Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming here tonight. My name is Cindy Shen, the co-founder of 21 Watt. Nowadays, many undergrad students are conducting research either in classes or as, in, as their own interests, but they got few chances to have their work published. So as a consequence, their peers get little access to their scientific works, and they have little chances to communicate with each other. Besides their peers, their companies such as General Electric, Google, or IBM, they're seeking for genius ideas as well as potential employees who's interested in doing research in the R&D department. So we need a solution to get these ends connected, and here comes 21 Watt. We're engaging in publishing research articles for undergrad students, and we are engaging in formal community based undergrad students across this country, promoting scholarly exchange among undergraduate students in different universities and colleges. We believe what we do is not just publish articles, but also to encourage students to pursue science and engineer and engineering as their careers, to uncover the mystery of nature, and to make innovations contributing to a better world in the future. And that's why we call it 21 Watt. We believe these young people, these genius ideas, are the power for the 21st century. Thank you. thought uh, about the revenue model and students probably don't have that, that much money so how does this <coughs> make money? Okay so first I want to introduce our cost we're, off, we're running a very low cost because we're going to like operate the whole thing online and Duke University Library are going to help us and they have uh, they're now launching a pilot uh, project with public knowledge uh, project this is a company in Canada and all thing is free is open source and open to everyone so that the authors can just update their information and their assets online and the professors here at Duke will review the whole thing online and will publish electrically the thing that we approved online so everything is like everything's online and everything's free and there's no subscri subscription fee and so how are we going to make money we are going to do the thing by advertising so the first thing that we are going to communicate with like 
uh, graduate admission offices in other universities because they are going to they want to like publicize their like graduate schools and they want to recruit new students coming to their graduate schools. And the first thing that we have already talked to the university physics department and they are really interested in your program and they just gave us our first fund like. Five hundred dollars a year is not a lot, but it's a good start. And our next steps talk to like these companies that I mentioned above, like because they are interested in recruiting new members for their R and D department, and they're really interested in making some ideas that can apply to the industry. So like we're going to ask this, these companies to like maybe do advertisement on our website to make money. Is there concern about um, copyright or privacy with some universities? Not interested in, like Duke, not interested in letting Stanford know the ideas that their undergraduates are creating. Okay, I feel like so now this all these mainstream scholarly journals are publishing articles in the like scientific world. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's issue like that. And the good thing is that we are not going to claim the copyright of these essays or papers, so that author the authors can uh, publish their thing on our website online, and they can submit their like things to other like journals, maybe science or nature later. So we don't we won't claim their copyright, and this is not really a Duke affiliated thing. So I think that's a good thing. And the other thing is about like, um, so we think that, uh, we're going undergraduate researchers are not really interested in doing the real science world thing. So most of them are doing things that can be applied into the industry. So it's a really good thing for them to get connected to these industries and to really have their things like to be realized in the real world. So. Um, I guess just competition <coughs> in this space. Is there is there something that exists or not? There isn't anything like this today. There was there was something like that in the past. I can name some of them like Jupiter, like. But uh, this magazine's our journals are not really active now. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Devil Heel. Hi, I'm Ben Cohen, and I'm Dan Romero, and we will be the respective editor and publisher of DevilHeel.com, a news website covering two of the most prominent athletic departments in the country, Duke and North Carolina. Building on media models already in widespread use, we plan to fill the void left by the shaky state of local media. Our, our, uh, the primary role of our staffers will be as uh, of content producers, content aggregators, and content curators. Our initial editorial team of four reporters will already be the largest group of journalists covering these two entities. And instead of focusing on the type of commodity content that they can link to on the web, They'll produce in-depth perspectives, expert analyses, public interest investigations, long-form feature writing, they'll shoot video, they'll tweet, they'll blog, they'll do everything implicit with being a journalist today. In addition, we'll host a stable of outside bloggers who want a voice about Duke, North Carolina, or college sports in general, all in an effort to replicate the type of community around these two programs that already exist on the web, but are fragmented between newspapers, blogs, and message boards. We want to bring the functionality of that coverage and discussion under one roof. In short, we want to drive the conversation around Duke and North Carolina athletics, and we also want to host that conversation. We've experienced working at both TechCrunch and Gawker Media, and working there, we realized there are a number of different revenue streams for online media sites that traditional outlets don't take advantage of. One would be uh, merchandising. So in addition to advertising, you had merchandising, uh, t-shirts, uh, other merchandise, uh, College Humor has taken this model with busted tees and done very, very well for themselves with it. Another would be uh, conferences. The New Yorker um, has taken conferences in New York uh, around different topics and done very well, as well as TechCrunch with TechCrunch 50. Um, and finally, things like content licensing in terms of being able to redistribute our content with something like a Yahoo Sports because our content will, won't be commodity content, it'll be you know, higher value feature type content. We have a lot of growth opportunities in terms of other rivalry markets. You touched upon it on, on the closing of the two minutes, which was, it seems like there's rivalry elsewhere in the United States that um, is as, maybe not as strong as this area, but that you could play upon. So if you could just touch, touch upon how you could take this 
local sports market and maybe establish it in a few other areas? You know, there, as you said, there are rivalries everywhere. Los Angeles, <laughs> UC, USC, UCLA. In the Midwest, you have Texas, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Louisville. You know, college sports thrives on rivalries. And, you know, we think that when there is an antagonism between two teams, um, these, you know, it's unique because for these rivalries, Duke fans are just as interested in North Carolina content as they are in Duke content. Uh, but we also think that in terms of scaling nationally, not only do we have this network of rivalries, but uh, as ESPN expands into more local markets, we want to sort of beat them to the Carolina market because we're already here. We already have, you know, we, we have a knowledge in the market. So not only in terms of Duke and Carolina, but then you also think about expanding into NC State and Wake Forest, football, NASCAR, I mean, ESPN Carolina, focusing on, the, on first on this micro niche of Duke and North Carolina that has you know, plenty of potential to, to go in, in a lot of ways. Can you explain a, a little bit more? I understand that you know, people are, Duke people may be interested in North Carolina sports and so forth. There's independent sites about you know, <coughs> UNC and about Duke. Can you explain a little bit more how bringing those together, you know, makes it more interesting, or do you have any specific ideas that would kind of, um, you know, help me imagine? Yeah, so the community right now is pretty fractured, um, and bringing it under one roof, uh, a la Huffington Post style, where you really emphasize the community as well as kind of news, um, we think would be pretty valuable, because right now there are some very good community aspects again, fractured, so the idea of bringing it all under one roof, we really feel like there's gonna be a lot of added value. In addition, we're doubling the content in terms of you know, Duke and North Carolina. The primary competition at first in terms of content producers are the, are the News and Observer and the Herald Sun, both of which cover Duke and North Carolina really extensively. Uh, we think we can cover it better uh, and more, you know, produce more content, and we think that's sort of where the media industry is going. And it, it seems like you wouldn't need very much money to do this, because, uh... Well, we'd have a pipeline of college reporters. We'd have the largest staff covering Duke UNC in the country right now because the Herald Sun and News Observer will cut back. Mm -hmm. um, college reporters, you wouldn't have to pay very much money to it as they come out of school. They'd have experience working on it, and it would all be open source. So we'd be right. using WordPress, um, you know, very, very low cost. So we'd be competing against traditional media outlets that have extremely high overhead yeah. and you know, inherited costs. And in addition, in terms of, you know, we, we briefly mentioned the advertising review. Uh, one of the other goals is to have a function in Wikipedia on the back end that is the uh, preeminent source for anything encyclopedic about Duke and North Carolina that generates more and more page views and harnesses oh, the knowledge. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Know it when it is up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Ron Ray, and I'm a Duke senior passionate about math and science education in this country. Now, I'm convinced that math and science skills are the cornerstone of our national greatness and competitive ability, yet it is no secret that we are completely falling behind in this regard. Now, this is where my idea for the website, Know It When It, comes in. Now, some of you may remember as kids spending hours and hours on elementary school fundraising campaigns just so you could win that shiny new toy in the fundraising booklet. Or perhaps you spent hours and hours on the Accelerated Reader Project just so you could win that trinket from your teacher. Now what if we could apply that same potential using the large scale of the internet to hone the math and science skills of American youth? Here's how Know It When It works. If you're a kid, log in to Know It When It for free, start an account, and start answering math and science questions. As the questions get more and more difficult, you get more and more points. After you win a certain amount of points, redeem those points for gifts and services from corporate sponsors. Now you might wonder, what's a business model exactly? It's actually quite simple. Now, as a corporate sponsor, you provide the rewards and services for the kids. In addition, for our revenue stream, you provide us with payment for no it win it. In return, you receive large-scale embedded advertisements like on Pandora.com, and you, and you receive access to a large youth market, positive PR for investing in education, and the development of early brand loyalty among youth, which is incredibly invaluable. This, in a nutshell, is Know It Win. Um, how do you create the content? It seems like there would be a lot of questions that need to be generated. So I, I guess that's a big part of the, of the expense, I would say. Right, well, there are a few ways to approach that. Number one is to have a team dedicated to writing the questions. 
Another way is to creatively think about where you could get the questions. So for example, um, in many English-speaking countries that contain lots of uncopyrighted sources, you could obtain source material for the questions from there. For example, from India, uh, where there are a lot of uncopyrighted sources, but in perfectly good English and math questions that could be adapted. Um, so that's one opportunity that we've thought about. So is it all multiple choice answers? Well, it could be multiple choice, but it could also be um, straight up answers. So if it's a math question, the answer is 45, they'll have to enter 45. Um, depending on the difficulty, they could get additional points if it's more difficult because there's no multiple choice. Mm -hmm. What's your um, plan for kind of getting the word out to kids and you know that advertising campaign? And also, uh, how do you make it fun for kids so that they actually want to go do work for fun outside of school? Right, great. Well, basically, um, could you repeat the first question? Uh, what's your plan for getting the word out to kids? Like, it seems like some advertising or something would be required to actually get right. people using it. It would also require going to schools and pitching it at schools and convincing educators of its value there. Um, but also getting kids excited, it will be geared towards kids so they can see, for example, coins stacking up perhaps or some sort of animated figure uh, sort of complimenting them for getting questions right. And it's also supposed to develop satisfaction and goal setting so that once they you know, use the website, they can also get excited about education in general because of the goal setting and the rewards they're receiving. Are you aware of um, a competitor within the space today? Um, there's no competitor with free access that provides rewards, as of my knowledge. Um, there are websites that have games for kids, um, but they're just flashy games that allow kids to answer questions in game formats, but there are no rewards involved. Is there, a, is there another <coughs> analogy out there on the internet? You know, not, not doing math and science problems, but something where you're drawing lots of traffic and the sponsors are providing the reward? Um, not that I know of. Um, and so I, I'd have to look into exactly why there aren't. Yeah. Um, but I think specifically for this, um, it's a model that could work because of other non-internet-based businesses, like, for example, a Pizza Hut reading program, which a lot of kids read books and then go to Pizza Hut and get rewarded. Um, so if we could transfer some of that onto the internet, perhaps. And so your company gets paid by the sponsor, and then the sponsor also provides some reward. How, uh, what's your plan for... Oh, thank you. We have one more contestant. That's true. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm Andrew, and this is Brian. And ads are boring. So we are introducing symbiotic ad advertising with AdStream. Our goal is to create a mutually beneficial relationship between advertisers and individuals. Let's take a look at the issues. Ad consumers, people like you and I, face two problems. One, ads are irrelevant and annoying. AdStream provides the relevance. Information or ads that are useful to you or things that you care about. Two, consumers don't know the value of their computer screen. AdStream returns ad revenue back to the consumer in exchange for a small screen presence. Um, excuse me, exchange for a small screen presence that doesn't interfere with anything, with any of your usage. In fact, of the 150 people we polled, 100% said they'd be willing to give up 10% of their of their screen space. Thanks, Andrew. On the other side, ad advertisers are facing two main problems: one, incomplete information, and two, confusing information. As a result, they end up paying more to acquire the next customer than they ought to. AdStream is like Pandora for ads. We're actually going to ask consumers about their interests, pair that with their behavior, and then show them ads with Pandora-like controls on them. <clears throat> Our ad delivery is going to get smarter, and we'll, at, we'll be giving value back to the advertisers. Advertisers also get three other things. They'll get great data, they'll get user feedback, and they'll be able to talk to our users to crowdsource their marketing efforts. Thanks, Brian. 
Right now, our team of MBAs, as, long as, a, as well as a programmer and an engineer, are working directly with advertising executives, as well as professors in marketing and the behavioral economics space to help us focus our research. Thank you. Sounds like you guys, you, you talked a little bit about potentially users being able to rate ads. Can you get into that a little bit more? So just like on Pandora, when you say thumbs up or thumbs down to a, a song, um, same thing, just trying to understand exactly what you like. So you might say your interest is like outdoor sports, but um, hey, you really don't like mountain climbing and you see a, an ad to go climb a mountain. I don't know if you say, hey, I don't want to see that anymore. And the same type of kind of rich menu that can come up to say, yeah, this is a favorite ad of mine, or I really don't want to be shown anything like this anymore so we can get more intelligent. Have you considered extending that model into the web browser so potentially ads you're seeing you could be providing the same kind of feedback but not on your screen but actually during your normal web surfing? We've played around with that and we're looking actually into add-ons in Firefox right now, but we actually, we're just trying to focus on this right here to see, you know, how can we build a beta, a beta prototype see what kind of proof of concept we have at a local university, perhaps. Um, so just so I understand, so the, the screenshot that you have here, someone's working on Word document, and they're seeing an Acura. So right now, they're, they're not related, other than the fact that I might be a bar, uh, you know, I might be interested in an Acura. But you're not looking at what the person is doing on the computer to figure out that this ad might be related to it. The person's not writing about car racing. Is that correct? Do you understand my question? So, yes. So like yeah. Google, when I search on Google, that's the thing that works tremendously on Google, and the fact that all their ads are related to what I'm searching for. So I think we're worried about it being ultra creepy, right? So, yes. um, I, but that kind of utility-based advertising is what we're thinking of. So maybe what, one thing we've, we've thought about is you might be able to opt into what we can look at. So maybe you're okay with us looking at that Word document, maybe not. Maybe you're okay with us looking at your iTunes library. Mm -hmm. And we know that based on your iTunes library, you're a big fan of a certain musician who's in the area. Boom, we'll throw up an ad for the fact that they're going to have a concert. You can buy tickets that way. So I think just we have to still understand what our user base is going to be comfortable with letting us see. Um, but the idea is making the ad more related to what it is we're doing. And this isn't exactly entirely representative of how it's going to work. We just want to show the separation between what you're doing and the ad that shows up as far as not interfering with your activity. Right, and this person's managed to make thirty-four hundred dollars in twenty-three. They've had it for a while. Yeah, <laughs> that's money-making experience, right there. Well, actually, the people we pulled, the average usage was about five and a half hours a day. So I mean, right. you can aggregate that up to almost one hundred sixty-five, hundred seventy hours a month. You know, depending on what we could, uh, what we could return back to people in a year. I think you could see a substantial amount. Mm -hmm. So explain that model again. How? How if this adds up? Thanks, guys. Oh, but you guys would have had a good time. Let's uh, let's give everyone a round of applause. Hey, guys, so now that uh, everybody got their vote in, um, I want to do a, a quick pitch here. So, uh, so uh, my name is Stephen Powell. I'm one of the co-presidents of the Startup Challenge this year. Uh, first, I just want to congratulate and thank uh, everybody that pitched tonight. Great job. Quick uh, round of applause. Very impressed. Very impressed. Um, so, uh, obviously, the elevator pitch competition is, is just the first first uh, phase of, of the Duke Startup Challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the premise of, of doing this is to really help you guys or, or, or give you a platform to help you sort of distill and hone down your idea to something that, you know, you, you can walk in front of any investor or potential partner or even uh, a potential employee. I, some of you guys were pitching that, uh, you know, you're looking for employees, not necessarily capital. So, uh, but hone down the idea so that, uh, you know, you can walk up to anybody on the street or in the elevator or somebody you meet at a conference and uh, get their attention very quickly. So um, that's really the, the, the point of this, this first uh, phase of the competition. Next phase is to take those ideas that you have. You guys obviously have a lot of ideas in your head, um, and to, to start expanding on those. And so the next next phase of the competition is the executive summary competition. And I encourage everybody that's uh, certainly pitching tonight to participate in that. And even if you didn't pitch tonight, uh, you, you can also uh, also participate in it. 
And the idea is it's a five-page uh, document that, um, you know, so the premise tonight was you're trying to get a second meeting with an investor or a partner. The idea with this is uh, this, this second meeting is, you know, at their office, and you're going to give a 10-minute investor pitch, you know, with a full-blown PowerPoint slide deck. Um, and so the executive summary is meant, again, to entice them to, to want to give you that second meeting. So the five-page executive summary is due in January. We haven't finalized the exact date, but expect sometime in, in late January. Um, and then we'll unveil, there'll be prizes associated with that, and then we'll unveil the finalists in February. And then the finalists um, from the executive summary competition will move on to the uh, finals event that happens in April. And basically what that looks like is it is a 10-minute investor presentation, and that's when you actually need to write your full booklet business plan. So over the course of the year, you're further developing your idea and you're expanding the, um, uh, the sort of quantity of the, of the ideas that you're sharing with, uh, with investors. So that's, I'd encourage everybody to, uh, to participate in that. The second pitch I'd like to get is for the final event that's happening this Friday. So um, uh, Sanjay mentioned it at the beginning of the, of the night, but uh, at the end of the week, um, on Friday uh, evening, starting at 5.30 p.m., we're having a networking reception here at Fuqua, and then the event starts at 7 o'clock. And we're fortunate enough to have Bill Maris, who's one of the, well, he, he's the co-founder of Google Ventures. So um, he, uh, he wanted to get reconnected with Duke, and um, Duke Star Challenge was a, was a perfect way to do it. So he's, he's going to be joining us. He'll also be the co uh, keynote uh, speaker that night. Um, and for the event, <laughs> Uh, free food, uh, free beverages, um, alcoholic beverages require IDs for uh, immigrants, and um, uh, we're also giving away uh, free t-shirts. Uh, and by the way, so anyone that competed tonight, uh, you can pick up your free t-shirt either afterwards or you can pick it up on Friday um, at the event itself. But I think it should be a fun night, and the obviously the finalists, or the, the winners from tonight will be we'll move, moving on to the, uh, the finals on Friday. So see you all there. Well, we're still waiting. I'll do another pitch because we got your time. So, uh, how many folks have been to um, the Duke Entrepreneurship Education Series events? Okay, so not not everybody in the room. So, uh, I'll do a quick pitch for that. So, Duke Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneurship Education Series. It's a, a weekly um, education series that coincides with the schedule of the Duke Startup Challenge. Um, covers topics anything from how to finance your your venture to you know, business plan 101 to venture capital 101. Um, it's just a, a kind of wide-ranging uh, uh, series of, of topics. And we bring in speakers that are um, you know, very experienced in those areas. Um, and those, those happen both here and um, at uh, the engineering school over at here. So if you're uh, if you're one of those, if you've missed any of those, you can go to the website where all the, the past Presentations and videos uh, are posted. It's www.dukebees.com, D E E S.com. Uh, so it's a good resource for you guys as you're developing your, your executive summaries. All right, thank you guys. I'm going to ask the three judges to give us some feedback on how the day went and just kind of the, the quality of the pitches that each one of you guys came up with. So the floor is open. Please feel free to give genetic feedback while you put up the standards. Um, so, great job, guys, for, for all your pitches. I would say, I guess just the overall theme that I look for, and as you look to um, critique or better your pitch in the future, some of you guys did this, some of you guys didn't, we talk about the, the competition and who exists within the space and really kind of understand people that may have lost in the space in the past um, or people that, may are, that, that are winning today. So um, if you have a, a competitor within your space that has raised a lot of capital, that demonstrates that the market exists and it should not necessarily deter you from going after that, um, that particular market. Uh, it demonstrates that, that, um, that other people believe it to be a good idea also. So I guess that's just the primary theme that I would suggest as you work to try to get things down to two minutes is, is to try to talk about a little bit more about the competitors that, that might exist within your space. Yeah. Good. Um, probably a couple other things to, uh, you know, two minutes is a very short period of time, but if you can offer anything about pricing, uh, that's very helpful. And um, 
And then I guess maybe if you could just like make three bullet points in terms of like, you know, what are the real execution risk problems? Uh, so, you know, that we can kind of quickly ascertain, you know, is this something that can be done in a relatively short period of time uh, with a small amount of capital or, or are there some really, really big roadblocks? Yeah, I think uh, overall there were some really high quality ideas. Um, multiple ideas I think could be very successful in the market. And so um, ultimately we had to choose one, but um, we were really overall impressed, I think. And I would just, for me personally, these two guys are coming from somewhat of a venture investor background. I grew my company organically. And so I would also give a piece of advice that it's always good to be able to figure out a way for your idea that it can see it can succeed at a small level before it succeeds at a big level. Um, that market validation is, is crucial and kind of getting you out of the bubble that you might get in when you're writing business plans as a student. I think if you can do something that can start, the market ultimately will tell you by paying you money whether your idea is valuable and the faster you can get to that, the better. That's it. Great. Thank you guys. Um, we have the results in and uh, it's all yours. Okay. Sure. The, uh, before I get to the, the winner of the audience choice, uh, we had a two-way tie for second place, and that was Power to Go and Food for You. So uh, great job to both of you guys. And $100 cash. Thank you. And QuickBooks Pro goes to AdStream. <clears throat> Come on up and get your... Uh, Copy of the books and is Howie here? How would you just like to get a picture? Yeah, yeah, next door. All right. Okay, we'll get you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Share with Howie afterward. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>